In this video, I will be walking you through the solution to question number two from the chapter seven problem solving set, where we are asked to give the substitution SN1 and elimination E1 products expected from the following reactions. So to get right into this, the first part of this has us reacting three bromo, three ethyl pentane heated in methanol. And we're asking for the SN1 and the E1 products because remember that these two reactions compete with one another whenever we have an alkyl halide reacting with a generally weak base to give this E1 possibility here. The difference between SN1 and E1 in terms of what's going on is in the SN1 reaction, we have a nucleophile that is going to replace the leaving group within the molecule where the leaving group is our halogen. In the E1 reaction, the nucleophile, rather than attacking a carbon atom, which makes it constitute a nucleophile, instead, it is going to act as a base, where the base is going to remove a proton, because that's what bases do, bases grab protons, and it is going to eliminate that proton and the leaving group from the molecule to yield an alkene product. So elimination reactions are always going to yield alkene products. Substitution reactions are always going to result in the leaving group being replaced with a nucleophile. So we'll walk through that, including um, to get to our correct product here, I'm gonna do the reaction mechanism for each of these. So with SN1, the first step of the reaction mechanism is that the leaving group leaves. So we'll go ahead and draw that out as the leaving group leaving here. So we have our leaving group break away there at step one of the reaction mechanism. That's going to give us our bromide anion as well as a carbocation. And this particular carbocation, if we classify as primary, secondary, or tertiary, we'll see it's a tertiary carbocation because there's three alkyl groups directly bonded. And tertiary carbocations are not generally subject to carbocation rearrangements. So we don't need to worry about doing a one-two shift here. Instead, we can jump right into step two, which in step two, we are going to have the nucleophile attack the electrophilic carbocation. Our nucleophile here, looking at our reactants, is going to be our methanol, CH3OH, that's our source of a lone pair of electrons here that act as a nucleophile. So lone pair comes in, forms a covalent bond there. And that will give us this. And keep in mind the question doesn't specifically ask for the reaction mechanism here. I'm just drawing this out in an abbreviated form in order to make sure that I am drawing the correct product here. Because if you skip straight from the starting materials and try to predict the product, sometimes you'll make a bit of a mistake because you will forget to or not recognize there needs to be a carbocation rearrangement or things like that. So mini mechanism here, not every single step in all the gory detail, but spelled out enough that I can work my way through in a logical manner to the final product. So after the nucleophile has attacked the electrophilic carbocation here to give us our alkyloxonium intermediate, that's this guy right here, what's going to happen is our deprotonation step, and I'm going to abbreviate that just as minus H plus, indicating that we are losing a proton at that step. And that particular proton that we're going to lose is going to be this one right here to give us an ether functional group in our final product. So we'll go ahead and draw out our final product here, like so. So that's going to be our nucleophilic substitution SN1 reaction product, where we've just replaced the bromine leaving group with our methoxide group, methoxy group. So that's our SN1 reaction product that I've highlighted there in blue. And then we go on to the E1 reaction product. So to draw the mini mechanism for this, or my outline of what's going on, 
keep in mind that for E1, the first step of the mechanism is the same as it was for SN1. That is that the leaving group is going to leave at the first step of the E1 pathway. Then at that point, since we don't need to do a carbocation rearrangement, that is where things are going to diverge. So here, rather than having the nucleophile methanol come in and attack the carbocation, instead, the methanol is going to act as a base. Because when we look at nucleophiles that have a lone pair of electrons, in addition to those being able to act as nucleophiles and bond to a carbon atom that is electrophilic, they are also able to act as bases. And that's what's going to happen here, is that the methanol comes in, and those lone pairs on the oxygen are going to act as a base. And specifically, they are going to carry out a beta elimination. And when we say beta elimination, what we're referring to is that if we look one bond away from the carbocation carbon, we're going to be removing a proton from one of those positions. So we've got three equivalent positions here, meaning three positions that are all symmetrical, they are all equal, and therefore we can remove a proton from any of those. So to show that happening, I'll show one of those bonds explicitly. Lone pair of electrons come in, grab that proton. That's why we call the methanol a base here. And that carbon-hydrogen bond has to go somewhere. It's going to come over here because that's going to give a stable product because that will allow us to get rid of that positive formal charge that's making the carbocation relatively unstable. And so then we will end up with our double bond right there. And we will also create, as our other product of this, CH3OH2 because our methanol picked up a proton in that process. So our final E1 reaction product here is going to be this that I've plugged in in our box there, that final alkene product, because an elimination reaction E1, or E2 for that matter, will always yield an alkene product by removing the halogen leaving group, which I've highlighted in blue there in your lower left, and also by removing a proton that is beta to the carbocation on the adjacent carbon, in other words. And we will always do this following Zaitsev's rule. Zaitsev's rule says that you want to make the most alkyl substituted alkene product possible. In this case, since we have three identical groups bonded to the carbocation here, here, and here, it doesn't matter which of those protons you remove they're all going to lead to exactly the same constitutional isomer product. So that's our substitution elimination products for this one. Let's try the next problem. Okay, so continuing on with part B here, I've drawn out our two starting structures here, our ethanol and our 1-bromo-2-methylcyclohexane. And I've indicated here as highlighted in blue, we're going to do an SN1 reaction in the top case, an E1 reaction in the bottom case, since those two reactions will compete with one another when we have an alkyl halide reacting with a structure that can act as either a base or as a nucleophile. So starting with the SN1, much like up top, the first thing that is going to happen in the reaction, sketching out our pathway here, is that the leaving group will leave. So our leaving group breaks away in this mini mechanism, as I call it, because we're not drawing every step out individually one by one. We're just trying to trace out what's happening here. So we generate our carbocation. And anytime you recognize that you've generated a secondary carbocation, indicated by the fact that you have two alkyl groups directly bonded here, that's an indication that you need to be on the lookout for the possibility of doing a hydride shift or a methide shift to create a more stable carbocation product out of this next step. And here it is possible 
to do a carbocation rearrangement that will convert that secondary carbocation into the more stable tertiary carbocation. So we have hydrogen bonded right here, hydrogen bonded right here. And what we can do is we're allowed to move a methyl group or a hydrogen by one spot, by one carbon atom, doing this one, two shift, over toward the carbocation to enable that carbocation to move to a different spot. So we're going to take that hydrogen atom that is highlighted in green there. And what we'll do is move that over one spot so that it's now bonded to that carbon that's originally the carbocation carbon. Upon doing that, we end up with a CH2 group right here. And now our carbocation, the positively charged carbon, is going to end up right here. Then, to do the substitution, we continue by bringing in our nucleophile. We have ethanol here ready to go as our nucleophile. So that's going to come in. In this nucleophilic substitution pathway, attack the carbocation. And that's going to give us our alkyl oxonium, where we have our O-ethyl group bonded right here. And that proton still hanging out there. And then abbreviating here in step four, we're going to lose that proton in our deprotonation step. So we lose that proton. And that's going to give us our final product, which here will be an ether. So we have our O ethyl group right there as our final product. So we're going to draw that in up here. O ethyl. And I'm just going to put a box around it for clarity here. So that is our SN1 reaction product, where we have removed the bromine atom as the first step of this mechanism. Then secondly, we had to do a carbocation rearrangement because we started with a secondary carbocation over here on our right. We have our secondary carbocation. We rearranged that. Then we had our nucleophile, finally, at step three, come in and attack. That created our alkyl oxonium, which should have a plus formal charge right there, which was subsequently deprotonated at step four. It loses that proton to give us our ether product. Then we'll take a look at the E1 reaction here. That's the one on bottom left right here for you. And for that reaction, the mechanism between SN1 and E1 are the same for the first couple of steps here. So for the first step in step one, we have the leaving group leave. So that's what's happening here is the leaving group is leaving. The leaving group is broken away to give a carbocation. Then the carbocation rearranges there at step two. Got to draw in my atoms because I accidentally erased a bit more than I should have. So carbocation rearrangement takes place. And then at that point, after that stabilized carbocation is created, that is where things are going to diverge from the SN1 route. So I'm just erasing here what's not relevant to the elimination route. So again, steps one and two were the same as they were for the SN1. Now, at step three, that's where things go differently, because at step three, that's where the base is going to carry out beta elimination. And so the base is going to come in and deprotonate at a position that is alpha, I mean, that is a beta proton to our positive formal charge. And those positions would be either the protons here in red, here in red, or here. Those are all representative places where the beta elimination could take place. We're going to be removing a proton from one of those positions, and the electrons that are liberated from the carbon-hydrogen bond by doing that are going to come in and form the carbon-carbon double bond to give us our alkene product. So how do we choose which of those protons to remove? We follow Zaitsev's rule. 
Zeta's rule saying that we want to create the most substituted alkene product. We can. And so when we're thinking about where to remove a proton, the place we want to target is going to be either here or here. It doesn't matter which. Those are equally substituted, and they're, in fact, symmetrical, so they lead to exactly the same product. The one we want to avoid is we don't want to remove a proton from our methyl group there because that's going to give a less substituted final product. So it's always going to be better to remove a proton from a CH2 group than from a CH3 group because removing from the CH2 group is always going to give you the more substituted product. So removing a proton at one of those positions, I'm going to draw out one of the protons here explicitly. So I've got my proton drawn out explicitly and then coming in and acting as a base is going to be our methanol. By definition, our base is going to grab a proton there. Like so, that forces the carbon hydrogen bond to break and the electrons to come over here. Like such. And that gives us our alkene product. So alkene product like that. And I'll go ahead and put a box around that. So this concludes question number two, which the goal of this question was really to highlight that substitution reactions and elimination reactions compete with one another. And so if you were to start with one of these alkyl halide reaction reactants, like we've shown here, you would end up with a competition between the substitution route and the elimination route in these E1 and SN1 reactions to give two different possible products. The elimination product being an alkene, the substitution product corresponding to replacing the leaving group with a nucleophile. Stay tuned for the next video that will go through question number three from this.